Well, good evening. Thanks for joining this bonus webinar for our uh, Heart Month and for our Cardiac Rehab and Graduate Programs. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, some of you I saw just a couple of hours ago, and uh, boy, you're in for round two, a little more uh, discussion. Uh, it's nice to be with you. This time we're on a Zoom uh, platform, as you know. Um, and if you want to pose some questions through uh, through the course of uh, our conversation, or uh, maybe it's more of my presentation, uh, I think you're familiar enough with Zoom uh, to get into the Q and A uh, part of the screen uh, and just type in your question there. Um, if if that seems to be difficult, I think you might be able to raise your hand otherwise. Uh, but but Q and A would would be the way to do it. And I will pause occasionally and make sure that I check out uh, Q and A. All right. Uh, well, thanks again uh, for joining into this evening session. It's 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 evening. I appreciate we're busy with our families and dinner and cleanup and looking after kids and all kinds of things. But. Uh, uh, this seems to be a topic that's uh, of interest to some of you. And Danielle, if that's you, Danielle, in terms of being one of our uh, outstanding uh, colleagues uh, who pr provides uh, great direction in the exercise programs and rehab programs, uh, thanks for bringing this topic up to the front uh, on behalf of a number of your clients. So we're going to talk about medical and recreational marijuana, cannabis, and the heart. And this is me. Uh, for those of you whom I've not met before, my name is Paul O. Uh, I'm medical director in the cardiac rehab program alongside Dr. Caroline Chessex. Uh, my training is in internal medicine and clinical pharmacology. Uh, I've been medical director here for about 20 years, so it's nice to uh, be able to be with you. Uh, for the first time or the second time, uh, and to also dive into a topic that um, uh, I, I rather enjoy talking about because it does bring in uh, kind of interesting drug uh, drug medication kinds of, of, of uh, principles uh, alongside uh, thinking about heart health in, in a different way. Okay, so here's the th parts we're going to talk about. By the end of this session, I am hoping that you will be able to do the following. I'd like it if you could describe the pharmacology of cannabis and in particular distinguish the effects of, of compounds, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, and a CBD, cannabidiol. And you'll be good at uh, talking about the differences between these things by the end of this. So when you have dinner tomorrow with your family, we'll let, you can talk about pot, talk about THC, talk about CBD, what's the difference and why one compound might be more suited for management of, of uh, particular syndromes than another. But also, I think importantly, is, is a bit of a cautionary tale. And it would be nice for us to be aware of the adverse effects of cannabis, uh, both on the cardiovascular and on the lung system. Um, and particularly, it's the THC part of things that we want to be aware of. And as a bonus, yeah, if you want to have some fun with uh, friends, family, uh, offspring, uh, you can talk about what's the difference between a Kush and a sativa, and why might that be relevant if, if one was going to choose a, a particular cannabis product. Um, and the inspiration behind this session comes from stories of, of people whom I've met over the last few years. Uh, and, you know, at, at one point, this was a very common question that came up. I haven't heard it too much recently, but uh, but judging from at least a bit of interest from this group that um, uh, folks are interested. And it is interesting that we've... Uh, posted a couple of these lectures online, and I've, I've provided the, a, a version of this lecture to many audiences uh, in Canada and the U.S., and this is probably the thing that's drawn more attention than anything I've talked about in the last few years. So uh, I think it is of relevance. We'll talk about why. So we could ask these stories. You know, a 65-year-old woman who had known coronary artery disease, CAD, uh, asked a uh, you know, she was an occasional cannabis smoker and just wondered, should she have any concerns whatsoever with respect to the heart? So we're going to go through the data about this. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I saw a, a young man who had gone into hospital with, with a heart attack. 
Uh, he didn't have any of the usual risk factors as we might expect for a 35 year old man. Like he didn't have high blood pressure. He didn't have diabetes. He didn't think he had high cholesterol. There was nobody in his family that had heart problems at a young age. So the only thing that was remarkable in his kind of medical background was that he was a frequent cannabis smoker. So it begs the question, is there any relationship between a heart problem and cannabis smoking in young people in particular? And then I recall vividly, this came up in the course of a regular question and answer period during the rehab program. And a gentleman who was sitting at the back of the room said, let me tell you my story. And he shared that, uh, you know, a few weeks previously, he had actually been admitted to the hospital. He was he was told subsequently that he was quite confused and his and his heart rate uh, was was running very much out of control. That's tachycardia, fast heart rate. Um, and, you know, we will wonder, is there any potential relationship with cannabis in a, in a situation like this? And, you know, the, the other uh, kind of stories that we'll get into would be, you know, given all the medicines that I'm taking, is there any potential interaction or interference with cannabis products and the usual heart medications that we might be taking? Uh, so I'm going to kind of wind up with that story. Uh, this is very relevant. In the last couple of years, the major cardiovascular journals, this one called the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and there's another one that I'll show you in a second, published big reviews about this topic, you know, saying that, you know, this is very relevant. Um, and cardiovascular practitioners need to learn more about it. So, so it's in the medical press as well as in the lay press. This was the other big journal called Circulation. Um, and this was a big enough topic that the American Heart Association felt that it was very important to outline the science of marijuana and cannabis and cardiovascular health. So if you wanted to learn a whole lot more from the medical literature, there's a couple of really great reviews that you could turn to about this. And part of the reason that it is so relevant that uh, in the United States over the last uh, you know couple of decades, there's been widespread use of cannabis. So, so think of the population of, of America being 300 million people, and almost one third of the population, therefore, were admitting from survey work that uh, that they had some cannabis exposure. And what's interesting, of course, in the states is that the legalization rules have been quite variable. In, in some states, for a long time, people have been able to access cannabis, whereas there are some states where even today it's it's theoretically illegal and you can't access this. Uh, of course, through underground black markets that there are ways of, of course, getting to cannabis and with without too much of a way of barrier. So 100 million people, one out of three Americans were using cannabis over the last number of years. And of that segment, about 2 million Americans who had heart disease were using cannabis translate that to Canadian kind of numbers, that's at least a few hundred thousand people likely with heart disease that are using cannabis. So as, as a practitioner, whether I know it or not, or want to ask about it or not, it's probably relevant for a lot of people. And that's what uh, that's what folks were telling me. And then, you know, early on when cannabis became legal in Canada, uh, I was in, in our intake clinics into cardiac rehab, I think one out of two people were either uh, stating they were using cannabis or were interested in using, using cannabis. So uh, it is it is a very common kind of topic. So it's worth for all of us and, and uh, myself as a healthcare practitioner to learn more about this. And I, I have no doubt that the folks on this line, one or more of you would know a whole lot more about this than I, uh, but I'm going to share a little bit of kind of um, my looks into um, kind of the pharmacologic and plant backgrounds of cannabis, and then go a little bit into the medical literature uh, about this topic. So I promised you in kind of a, um, the bonus item that we would have some understanding of the plants. Uh, 
Um, and cannabis plants are very old. They're thousands of years old, in fact. And in the kind of the origins, there were kind of major strains of plants. So those of you who grow gardens in the spring, you know that your plants and shrubs and trees have certain lineages, genus and species. And that was true for cannabis as well. And kind of as a general major divide, the strains of cannabis could be thought of in their origins as um, the genus of indica species. And then there was also the sativa species. Indica plants uh, grew typically in colder environments, like in the mountains in the north of India. Uh, and, you know, some of the names for these plants or and and uh, the flowers and strains that came out of it, uh, therefore grew names like Hindu Kush. So the Kush plant was an example of an indica. Um, the plant characteristics, so if you imagine trying to grow up in a mountainous area, then you might be shorter and thicker and closer to the ground, maybe to stay warm if you're a human, but maybe that's true for plants as well. The leaves were darker green in color. And the the chemical composition in general, but not, not as a hard and fast rule, was there tended to be less THC, the activating stuff that we're going to talk about in a second, and more of the CBD, the relaxing stuff. So when people thought of using an indica plant as their choice for a cannabis exposure, then this was one that would be thought to, to be more uh, kind of re relaxing and, and helping with sleep. So it might be one that you use at the nighttime. Um, and what uh, the young people around me told uh, would, would say to me that indica could be thought of as a plant that could put you in the couch. Uh, so nice and relaxed. On the other hand, there are plant strains that are of cannabis that are, are called sativa plants. And sativa uh, would be grown more in the hot countries, equatorial countries, Thailand, Southeast Asia, Central America. Uh, so, and these plants were tall and thin and lighter green and growing up towards the sun. Uh, so they're reaching out, they're stimulated. And indeed, it's thought that these plants in general, not a hard and fast rule, uh, would be stimulating. They would have more of the stimulating compound THC relative to the relaxing stuff CBD. So more stimulation, more euphoria, more, more focus. And people would argue that's the way that you would, they would start their day with, with, uh, uh, with some exposure to sativa to get, get higher creative imagining. And this is the stuff that actually gets you high. So interesting kind of fun thoughts of the difference between a kush and a sativa, not hard and fast. And these days, there's been a lot of crossing hybridization of these plants. And there really aren't very many pure indicas or pure sativas. Much of it is uh, hybrid either from the wild or in laboratories where strains are crossed over for other reasons. And, you know, folks are valuing plants that can grow in adverse conditions and you can manipulate the amount of THC or CBD or trying to manipulate the kinds of effects that one is trying to produce from this. But there's a little bit of insight there. At the chemical level, we've tried to simplify this somewhat and keyed on a couple of chemicals. One is CH, THC, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. That's the molecular structure of it. And just roughly, this is the stuff that gets you high, that is psychoactive. And others would argue that would be stimulating and creative and all, all these kinds of things. Uh, but that's the more the mental stimulation part of the of the cannabis. And on the other side, the major one is CBD or cannabidiol. And this one is not something that gets you high, but rather it might have other properties, medicinal properties, and the two kind of balance out. But this is a simplification because there's at least 400 different chemicals in this plant. 60 of them would be called cannabinoids. And THC and CBD would be examples of cannabinoids. And one of the other interesting uh, kind of substances that's within the cannabis plant are things that are called terpenes. 
kind of sounds like turpentine, doesn't it? Terpenes. And that's the way I think of it, because these are the chemical compounds that give a cannabis potentially its unique smell called a fragrant oil of many plants they induce their sense and flavors because once you've smelled cannabis burning um then you it, it kind of something that you'll turn to right or, or be, be able to reminisce about it's it's that, that skunky kind of smell and you know for the aficionados the uh, uh, the people that are, are connoisseurs of cannabis they might think of themselves as like wine connoisseurs right so you think a glass of red wine and they, they would kind of swirl it and smell it and taste it and talk about the oaks and tannins and leathers and other things that might be in the red wine well perhaps the cannabis aficionado would also talk about the terpenes and the the delicate balance of the thc and cbd that might be in a plant i'm not one uh who who can distinguish anything about these plants but that's kind of the interesting bits of pharmacology um, and then if one was going to kind of seek out a, a cannabis product, then it might be partly on the basis of the THC and CBD. And there are some plants, uh, if you buy flour or if you buy an oil or some other kind of edible product, then it might be labeled uh, as um by the amount of THC relative to CBD in it. And you know, a product that has a whole lot of THC or so-called THC dominant, probably people are using that to seek out the high related to this THC. The, whereas products that are CBD dominant, people might be using that, those kinds of products for things like pain control, where mostly it's CBD that might be helpful there. And then there are plants that uh, or products that might be balanced between the THC and CBD. Um, and for some uses, uh, having a mixture of the two is the thing that that, that might be helpful uh, to uh, kind of pr produce the, the, the desired effects. So this is complex. And, and, you know, one cannabis is definitely not like another, just like saying, I'm going to have some alcohol. What do you mean? What's the product? What's the alcohol content? What's the flavor, et cetera? That's the, that's the conversation or thinking that would, would go into this. The, the kind of the, the, the effects on the body. Um, earlier today, we were in a session with some of you talking about how the medications that we use for the cardiovascular system are really targeted either along a pathway or a receptor. And for cannabis products, it's also kind of similar to that, that the major uh, active products like THC, it works directly on a receptor that's distributed through the body. The CB1 receptor uh, is the site where THC attaches. In the brain, that's what stimulates the high. Elsewhere in the body, it may have some other kinds of effects. Uh, and this, these are the reasons that we might get some sense, uh, changes in sensation, the high. Some people get tired. Some people get sleepy. Some people use cannabis uh, because it can help with nausea. And there are some people, uh, for instance, with cancer who are on uh, difficult medications that are very useful to fight cancer, but induce a lot of nausea. And for some people, this is the way that they might deal with their, their nausea. And indeed, there's also prescription medications that work, that provide THC pharmacologically that can help with, with the uh, with the prevention of nausea. Some people find pain relief through this mechanism. Uh, and ultimately, the munchie kind of side effect, uh, wanting to seek out munchies, that is, that might be a THC, CB1 receptor mediated phenomenon. On the other hand, CBD is something that can change or modulate the effects of THC. And if you have a lot of CBD on board, then THC has a harder time binding to the receptor and getting through with its kind of uh, alerting effects. So CBD, either alone or with a little bit of THC, can have these kinds of effects. And, and from the list, you could see, well, these might be very interesting from a medicinal purpose, like helping with anxiety or um, protecting nerves in some way, uh, preventing seizures and uh, preventing mood swings and also helping with pain and perhaps uh, helping with arthritis. It, the, this is meant to be more of a descriptive list rather than a 
kind of a treatise of the of the medical studies in the area, um, because I think we're really catching up in terms of our understandings from from a medical research perspective on this. Cannabis can also be characterized by the different kinds of products and the ways that they are taken in. So there is the overall plant, and one doesn't take a whole plant and try to smoke it or do something else with it. It's the very tips where there's the flowers and the buds and it's the special oils um, where the active compounds are. So this is a roll up of some flower uh, from the plant, not the leaf itself. The flower can be taken, of course, and rolled into a cigarette-like uh, product uh, and, and burned and inhaled. And that's a very effective way of getting drug into the body very quickly. Inhaling something will get a, a chemical um, down into the lungs, across into the bloodstream, and up into the brain very, very quickly. I'm not saying that you should smoke or vaporize things because... Uh, but I am saying this is a very rapid way of getting things in. Smoking, of course, is associated with all kinds of other bad things because you're not only trying to move a particular drug substance or a compound, but there's hundreds of other things that get burned and lots of carcinogenic thing potentially that gets burned when you smoke stuff. Um, people turn to vapors then as an alternate to this to try to get a more kind of a pure way of, of getting drug into system fairly quickly. Of course, we have to be aware that sometimes in the vapor or in the, in the solution that there may be stuff that we don't want. And there was an outbreak of people having bad lung disease associated with, uh, with, with vaporization of oil because um, the the compound that the cannabis and the THC was put into actually turned out to be very harmful to the lungs. And it was vitamin E acetates and other things. So um, this is a way of, 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 of moving product. It is a way of getting to high levels very quickly. There's an on and an off again, and we're going to talk more about that. As an alternate mechanism, people can take cannabis products by mouth. Either you can put the flour into a cookie and have it or other baked product, or you can actually have uh, a distillate of the cannabis. So actually getting the compound of interest into an oil formulation, and you could take drops of oil or a set number of drops can be put into a capsule. Um, the advantage of this is that it's more predictable, not only in what you're ingesting, but also in the pharmacology and the time profile that happens thereafter for this part. So think of it like a medicine where you can predict that each time you're getting the same thing, about an hour or two afterwards, you're getting to your main effect. It gets worked through in the body and then gets excreted out thereafter. Um, we're going to talk more about cookies and brownies afterwards uh, as a way of, of ingesting things orally. Um, the, the, one of the hallmarks of these kinds of products, THC, CBD, other cannabinoids, is that they get absorbed into the body and then they get held into fat tissue and then they come out very, very slowly. Your high goes away fairly quickly but it's the compounds are measurable in the body for a long time. And this therefore makes it a challenge in terms of measurement of exposure. You know, it's not like one can do a breathalyzer test for alcohol to see how much is in the system. If you try to measure for the, pro the breakdown products of THC, they can be present in the body for days. They can also be measurable like in the urine even from a secondhand exposure. So you may not be using any product, the person next to you might be, but it's gonna be detectable on you. And that's why it was quite challenging in, in when cannabis got legalized of figuring out, well, what's the roadside test of exposure? And, and uh, I think everyone may know that there is no pharmacologic test. There is no breathalyzer alcohol equivalent of this, rather it's tests of impairment. Yeah, can you do your finger to nose test? Can you walk on a straight line? Are you balanced? Are you coherent? And, and that's the reason for that.
Okay. There are many health applications potentially of cannabis, and I'm not going to go through that today, but there are some good reviews, and this was one in the medical literature from a few years ago that that, that looked at you know dozens of potential applications for cannabis and cannabinoids. Uh, so there, there were many places where it might be used. I think the main, like, or, or one of the pervasive conclusions about the, the information or the medical research was that more research needs to be done, that there tends to be uh, a limitation of, of kind of traditional medical evidence, notwithstanding that the plants have been around for thousands of years. It doesn't mean that they don't work. We just don't have the evidence that they work really, really well compared to other things that we might recommend in evidence-based medicine. Because there are many potential applications and because there's a lot of interest both medically and recreationally, it's not surprising then that marijuana cannabis is the most highly used uh, product. Um, and you know, you, if you put this on an illicit list, as it is in many of the states uh, in, in the United States, then this becomes top on the list. There's a whole, again, social argument about whether this is the right way to characterize marijuana and cannabis, but, but so be it, that's the way that it was there. Uh, so when, when, again, once again, highlights that lots of people use this, we need to be aware of it. Okay, now we're getting to the cardiovascular parts of this. And if we ask the general question, is cannabis safe for the heart? We can answer this in a couple of ways. Um, one way I can answer this is generally, probably yes. But there are some safety concerns we need to be aware of. And if you did look at look for uh, kind of information online, it wouldn't be too hard to find headlines like this. This was from NBC News about a year ago that said, hey, there was this recent study that said frequent marijuana smoking was linked to the higher risk of heart attack. So what was, the, what was that about? Let's dive into that. Um, and the information about is cannabis safe for the heart comes from different sources. There are case reports, there are groups of people who have been followed. There are publications that do an overview of all of this stuff, like the Circulation American Heart Association statement. But what is lacking are the RCTs. RCT stands for Randomized Controlled Trial. A randomized controlled trial is kind of our gold standard in terms of evidence about whether something works or is safe. For instance, I can say with a fair degree of certainty that aspirin is a very good thing to take if you've had a heart attack because it will lower your risk of a future heart attack by 20 or 25%. I know that from randomized controlled trials where people, like thousands of people were divided into two groups. Half took aspirin, half took a sugar pill that looked like aspirin, and then they were followed for five years. The people that took aspirin had a much lower risk of having a heart attack than the people that didn't take aspirin. That's a randomized trial. That's good evidence. For cannabis, you can imagine no one has done the study where you take thousands of people, you get half of them to smoke cannabis, whether they want to or not, and the other half don't smoke cannabis, and then let's see what happens to them over time. Maybe in the future, somebody will do a study like that, but up until recently, one, cannabis was illegal in a whole lot of places. You can't give people illegal stuff and, and kind of randomize them and, and, and do these sorts of things. There may be biases uh, in the community that say, well, cannabis is dangerous, so you can't give people dangerous stuff. Uh, so, so we don't get this evidence. So much of it then is going to come from stories and observations, but, but they can be very big stories that will turn to to. But but just a heads up, that's where we're going right now. So if I go back to the per, my 65-year-old woman who asked me, she has heart problems, she occasionally smokes cannabis, are there any concerns for the heart? I could say, mostly safe, but here's a few concerns. And the news report would say, hey, there's a risk of heart attack. So let's look at this. There are a few small studies in the literature that we can point at uh, to, to inform pharmacology, like what happens? 
Um, notwithstanding, there's millions of exposures every year. What's in, published in the medical literature is actually quite quite sparse. But here's an interesting study that I point to. It was uh, in the journal called Psychopharmacology from, gosh, 30 years ago. Uh, and in this project, 13 young men were paid to smoke a joint. And uh, while they were smoking their joints, they had their blood sampled and their heart rate measured. And they also did some checks on how well they were functioning from a brain perspective. It sounds kind of mundane, but it's actually good to quantify these things. So this represents the concentration of THC, the active stuff in cannabis that gets the brain excited. Um, and then this is time expressed as one hour, two hour, three hours, four hours. So here we see in green levels of intoxication and in red levels of heart rate. The black is the concentration of THC. So if you smoke a joint within 20 minutes, you get to a fairly high level of THC, but that's what we said, right? If you burn something, inhale it, take it into lungs, it gets yes. absorbed very quickly and up to the head. As the THC level it goes up very, very quickly, the level of intoxication shown in green goes up a fair bit. And also the heart rate goes up quite a lot as well. And in this case, it goes from a resting heart rate of about 60 up to about 100. So it goes up 40 beats within 20 minutes of smoking that joint. The THC levels come down over the course of one hour two hours, three hours, four hours, but there is still some that's hanging around there. The heart rate response goes up in red, and then it comes back towards baseline after an hour or so, and then just kind of hangs out there. And the brain effects, the intoxication goes up, hangs up above baseline for about an hour or two, and then after four hours, we seem to be back to baseline. So that's interesting just to document those kinds of things and the list of observations of faster heart rates and getting drowsy and dry mouth and getting munchies and things like that. That was all observed. The part that we're keying on here, of course, is that if you choose to get THC into your body very quickly, there is a measurable effect on the heart as well, that it pushes the heart rate from 60 to 100. It's like going out for a very fast walk uh, while you're just sitting there. So it begs the question, well, does that mean anything uh, in terms of stress on the heart? Well, here is another small study. Um, it actually is interesting. They were able to do this kind of placebo-controlled study, but only in 10 people, and this was back in 1974. But what's amazing is that this small study of 10 people only was published in the, the most important medical journal in the world called the New England Journal of Medicine. So they took 10 people who had angina, heart disease, and they were... Um, given a marijuana cigarette and then a placebo cigarette or in, in, in random order. And what they could see is that when people smoke marijuana, heart rate went up, blood pressure also went up. So the, the net effect of higher heart rate, higher blood pressure is more stress on the heart measured as myocardial oxygen demand. And there was also a measurement of carboxyhemoglobin. Remember, we're, we're, we're familiar with carbon monoxide poisoning, right? Like if you get a lot of bad gas, like from your car or from a faulty furnace or burning fuels inside your house, well, that's bad because it gets into your body and then it prevents oxygen from getting into your system. Well, that's what smoking does to you as well. So there is less oxygen that's available to be transited around the body and also to feed the heart. And what they observed, therefore, was that people that had angina already got worse angina or had a lower threshold for developing angina. Small study 30 years ago, it's not going to be done again, but it did document that, hey, smoking a marijuana cigarette pushes up heart rate. And if you've got heart disease, it can also make your heart situation worse. It therefore leads to the logic then, if we look at people who have heart attacks and you look backwards to say, hey, were you smoking marijuana at any time that led up to your heart attack? 
we might be able to find relationship. And that's what this study did called the determinants of myocardial infarction onset study. And they looked at the experiences of thousands of people who had experienced a heart attack and asked the questions, did you smoke cigarettes? And did you smoke marijuana cigarettes? And people hopefully answered honestly. And it seemed like there was a relationship, in fact, that if you smoke marijuana cigarettes more than once a week, the risk of having a heart attack was four times higher than people that did not smoke marijuana cigarettes. And the risk of dying was about three times higher. So there is something bad along the whole cascade of smoking pot and getting into heart problems. In a big population, uh, this was presented at a large cardiology meeting a few years ago, they looked at the experiences of 200,000 cannabis users versus 10 million people of similar age who weren't cannabis users. And once again, they were able to demonstrate that cannabis use was associated with a higher risk of, of heart attacks. In this case, it came out on average to be almost twofold higher. But what's interesting is if you break it down by age, uh, um, uh, age decades or age blocks, that the high risk in particular seemed to happen in young people, particularly young men, more so than young women. And again, young men and women have no reason to have heart attacks for the most part. Um, so if they do have a heart attack, there must be a reason, an extra reason in many cases. And in this case, smoking marijuana cigarettes on a regular basis increase the risk four to five times. So cannabis, kind of safe overall, but for some people, maybe risky. And it's interesting, these young folks were in particular were at risk, which begs the question, what's going on in young people? In the literature, in the medical literature in this area, there have actually been a number of case reports that look like this. A 35-year-old man who developed chest pain after smoking a joint, and now we can postulate, well, why might that be? Heart rate's up, blood pressure's up, oxygen is low, the heart is starving. When he went to hospital, they did the electrocardiogram that looked like this, and um, Trust me, this electrocardiogram looks very abnormal. It looks like there is a big heart attack that's going on right now. Uh, and uh, so that's a scary kind of situation. Um, and it may sound all too familiar to, to folks on the line right now of your own experiences. But again, this was kind of an odd sort of circumstance. And he had a strange kind of, of, of feature as well, um, as is usually done in the, in the around the time of the heart attack, the, the, the docs did a, an ultrasound or an echocardiogram of the heart to take a picture, to see what's going on, see how well it's moving. And they saw a very unusual picture of the heart called ballooning. Um, this is actually like, this is not heart shape, right? This looks like a pot and it looks like this pot. Not the, not the pot smoking. This is actually a pot, a clay pot. Um, this clay pot is what folks in Japan use to trap trap octopus, octopi. Uh, you attach this to a rope, you lower it down to the bottom, uh, onto the sea floor. Octopus will go in, hang out, think it's a nice new home. They pull up the pot, they find the octopus, and there's dinner. Um, in Japanese, this octopus pot, octopus trap, is called takutsubo. And in Japan, what they saw a couple of decades ago, was that there were people who were coming to hospital with what seemed like a heart attack, but when they took pictures of this heart, it looked like the octopus pot. So they called this takutsobo cardiomyopathy, uh, I guess an English version of, of takutsobo would be stress cardiomyopathy, because in Japan, they actually described this initially in people that had been through a tremendous stress, emotional stress in particular, in response to earthquake. And they saw that there were a number of people that had this, like, we hear the story, you know, terrible stress. Oh, he ended up in the hospital with a heart attack. Well, this was the, the version of heart attack that they saw. This syndrome exists today, Takutsobo. 
we see it occasionally, and maybe somebody on the line has had a Takotsobo experience. We see it mostly in women over the age of 50, mostly women. And it's different because when the angiogram is done looking for narrowings in the arteries, there really aren't narrowings in the arteries. Instead, this heart got stressed and stunned and, and, and terribly kind of put out of sorts because of the stressors. Okay, so why am I telling you this story? Because this is something that's seen in Japan. It's seen in North America and women who've gone through terrible emotional stresses or physical stresses. But in this story, what's been seen over the last number of years is that young men who develop Takotsobo, many of them were actually marijuana users. So this kind of changes this whole story of octopus trap, earthquakes, women, emotional stress. Instead, it's young men, marijuana smokers who get Takotsobo. So I guess pot smokers get pot heart in a way. Um, and it's interesting that marijuana use doubled the risk of this problem. So it's, it's rather unusual. So, um, you know, we can say cannabis use, heart disease, mostly safe, but there's these unusual things that can happen. One other thing that's been observed and shared in medical literature, the electrocardiogram up above is, is like jagged. It looks like teeth of a saw. This is not nice. This is something called ventricular tachycardia, a dangerous rhythm that can actually degenerate to death. Um, there are case reports of young people, again, young people that have no business having heart disease uh, coming in with this kind of rhythm. And what was remarkable in the story was that this person was smoking marijuana. And the observation when they investigated this person was it seemed like the blood flow through the heart was quite sluggish. And when you don't get enough blood and oxygen through the heart, it gets quite irritable and it can do things like this fluttering sort of thing. Okay. A more insidious cannabis story, if you haven't heard enough yet, uh, was the story that was shared to me by, uh, shared with me by one of our cardiac rehab participants who ended up in hospital with delirium and tachycardia. So we said, is this cannabis related? And the story, like the connection story is this one. Okay. I see one Q&A. Okay, good. So Francesco's asking about edibles, which is what we're getting into right now. Great. So let's talk about the edible story and thanks for setting this up. So the, the connection for this uh, was shown on the screen here. So some of you may be aware that um, there's various, very, um, I guess, industrious folks that take cannabis products and then repackage them in different ways. And uh, this is a uh, photo uh, from products available in a shop in Colorado. Colorado went legal before Canada did. Um, and for whatever reason, cannabis is packaged into things that look like candy bars. And even the names sound awfully familiar, don't they? Let me key on this one called the Keef Cat that I, I think we all recognize. Well, that sounds like a Kit Kat. And if you open it up, it actually looks like a Kit Kat chocolate bar, you know, the four bars there. Uh, what this gentleman shared with me was that he had been up at uh, his northern property. His son and friends had been um, staying there the weeks beforehand, had a nice party. Um, he went up, this gentleman went up the week or two afterwards, looked in the fridge and found what looked like a chocolate bar. Great chocolate bar, who can turn down chocolate? So he ingests not only one stick of the chocolate, because who can have only one stick of a Kit Kat bar, right? So you have one, two, three, four, and you can do that. Most of us, I would challenge, could eat a chocolate bar in five minutes, right? Five minutes, 10 minutes, no problem. The interesting thing about edibles, as one of our colleagues is asking, is they may be, quote, safer and that you may know what's actually in there. But because it's being ingested orally, you don't get any feedback on what you're eating. You don't get any high, you don't feel anything until a few hours afterwards. So you can eat a whole chocolate bar and it's inside of you and it's done. So what's interesting is that this kind of curve of THC levels and feeling intoxicated and heart rate going up is shifted by about three hours with the edibles. So you don't know the effects of what you've just eaten 
for about three hours, at which point all kinds of things can kick in. And for some of us, that's cool. That's nice. You, you can get your gentle high and, and, and do things. But for people that aren't expecting this and you're getting a maybe a large amount of THC all of a sudden hitting your system three hours later, what can happen is that you end up in the eMERGE. And the experience in Colorado, of course, they've, they've had a lot of pot experience there. They find that if people that smoke or vape, they're going to get the acute effects. They might get quite high really fast, end up in hospital feeling delirious. But with edibles, the intoxication or the heart problems are actually more common because they come on more slowly uh, and, and hit you all of a sudden later on. And the risk of actually problems is probably two times higher. It's not as common overall because more people smoke than, than eat things, but there is potentially risk here because there is no feedback, right? So if you had two brownies, who could stop at one, right? Have the two uh, and away you go. So it's an interesting sort of thing that comes on with edibles. So a summary then of, of the various things that can happen with our blood, our heart and, and vascular system. Um, we Because mainly of the THC effects, we can see an increase in adrenaline, increase in heart rate, a little bit of increase in blood pressure, but the two together can create extra stresses on the heart. Blood flow may be reduced. I haven't even talked about this, but there is this, um, for some people, kind of an immune reaction that might happen for, for folks, so whether that's cannabis or something that's around the cannabis that induces these kinds of reactions. And then there, there are reports of all of these things going on. Mostly safe, but there are some concerns, I think, is the bottom line here. And then just, just to build on the notion of smoking, that you know, this was a review article, again, in that big prominent medical journal called New England. This is from 10 years ago that talked about the adverse health effects of marijuana use, particularly on people that smoke repeatedly and causing increased airway resistance. You can read that as um, asthma or COPD, hyperinflation of lungs. Lungs get big. Lungs are meant to be more compact and, and have elastic properties. They can turn into big paper bags and they don't work very well. May make one more prone to developing lots of sputum and phlegm and cough and hacking, more rates of infection, and there's a potential for cancer. So one of the hard and fast takeaways from this is don't smoke cannabis. Don't smoke anything really because even though the product itself might not be so bad, the, the, the delivery is not a good thing. So that, that's one thing. Have we heard enough or is there anything else that we might think about? Let me pause there and see. Your opinion. Uh, so a question from one of our colleagues. Is it safe for a person with SCAD and fibromuscular dysplasia to take mostly CBD and a little THC? Um, was taking this before, it was helpful for pain, stopped after SCAD, no information available for safety. Is there a reliable entity one could check with? Um, and I don't know if there's a reliable entity. It's a great question. Um, again, I think mostly safe, especially if one is limiting the amount of THC, because that's the stuff that gets things activated. And in the setting of spontaneous coronary artery dissection or, or like bead-like narrowings, it's heart rate, blood pressure, extra stress on the heart that's the most concern. CBD doesn't do that. So if you're using mostly CBD and just a little bit of THC for, for a balancing effect, probably okay. The way you would do this, I, I would suggest you consult with a medical practitioner who's knowledgeable uh, about a cannabis prescription. Start low, build up slowly, make sure everything's okay. Monitor heart rate, monitor blood pressure, make sure you're doing all of those things. Um, the other concern that I would put up there, speaking of THC, is this, because there is this kind of feeling that, well, you know, our parents or somebody else grew up on pot, not such a big deal, right? So the, the, the challenge uh, in the environment, of course, is that over time, if one looks at the THC concentration in kind of an average sample of pot, plant pot, um, it's been really changing. And what used to be uh, 
plants that had 4% THC have now tripled. And it's possible to get THC in very, very high concentration, 70, 80, 90%. And if you put that much THC into the human body all at once, you can imagine the tremendous explosion of, of activation of heart rate, blood pressure, brain things. And that's why people actually can overdose and die on THC. So, you know, the, the headline that this is not your grandmother's pot anymore is absolutely true that things have changed. And this is what, 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 what has happened over years of, of hybridization, changing the plants uh, and the products that they, they produce because drug designers, designers want to make them more potent because it makes it more attractive for the consumers to buy this sort of stuff. Okay. Um, what about the interaction with THC and heart meds and someone else is concerned, but you guys are great because that's what's coming up. So um, concerns about this. So the next section here, how did you guys know we want to talk about interactions and um, it's something to be thoughtful about again probably okay, but just be thoughtful about some things. And I'll paint you a, a story here that's that's meant to be provocative. So if we think of someone, a 70-year-old woman who's had bypass operation and a valve replacement, and let's say she also has headaches and uh, she's got pain and tingling in her fingers and her toes, and uh, she has high blood pressure and she doesn't sleep well and she's stressed out. So Maybe she, she was, maybe, maybe you're on this call and you'll say, hey, I, I heard that, you know, CBD might be good for my pain and a little bit of THC. Okay. And it's going to help my sleep. And if I just get less stressed, everything will be better for me. So therefore cannabis might be okay. And of course you don't even have to listen to me, right? You can go to any corner store and there's so many pot shops that are out there. It's, a, it's quite remarkable. So both of you um, are raising the notion, well, let's be mindful of the medicines that we might be taking as well. So if I present to you this list of medicines, it might sound a little bit familiar, right? She is taking some aspirin. She is on a beta blocker drug called metoprolol, which is often used for people who've had a heart attack or heart surgery and high blood pressure. Amlodipine is an example of a calcium channel blocker that's very commonly used for blood pressure. She is on a statin drug for, for cholesterol control, like many of us are on. Um, she is actually taking something for... Um, pain and sleep. This is an older antidepressant drug called amitriptyline. Uh, and uh, many docs will prescribe this to help with and taken at bedtime to try to help with this with the pain and the sleep. And she uses some uh, acetaminophen with codeine like Tylenol ones or twos to help with pain whenever she needs it. And because she has a mechanical valve, she's also on a stronger blood thinner called warfarin. So this is not an unrealistic story of all of these kinds of medications. And I would wonder if, if some of you might think, well, if I compare my drug list to this drug list, there's actually a fair bit of similarity. So the question is, is this completely okay in, in the setting of cannabis? And the hypothesis is, hmm, let's be thoughtful. So cannabis can be associated with certain kinds of drug, drug interactions. There is a longer story about this that I won't go into today, but maybe at a future session. The, the, the reason that this is important when we think about drugs in general is that every drug, and as well as other things in the environment, they come into us and they're changed. They're particularly changed in our liver. That's the root for lots of things. Think of your liver as the garbage factory or the recycling factory, where everything has to go there for the depot, and then it gets processed in some way. The goal of the liver is to take all things that come into it and change it into a form that you can get rid of. Otherwise, everything that you take in is just going to stay there. Mostly, it tries to change things into a different formulation that you can pee out. So comes in through the gut or inhaled, travels around the body, goes to liver, liver changes it, puts it back into the bloodstream, goes to the kidney, the kidney pees it out. Wonderful. There are certain factories that live in the liver that are really quite important. And let's call this factory SIP3A4. Think of it like Oshawa was for GM. This is the major factory where production and change happens. You knock out this factory, bad things aren't going to happen, right? Um, 
CYP3A4 is responsible for the metabolism, the processing about half the drugs that we take. And for some people, it might be for all the drugs that you take. If you block this factory, it means that the drugs don't get processed. So think about drugs like the calcium channel blockers, like amlodipine, benzodiazepines, like um, lorazepam, uh, diazepam that some people use for sleep, cyclosporin that some people might use for uh, rejection after prevention of rejection, some statin drugs like simvastatin, uh, atorvastatin, um, 3A4 goes through this pathway. If you take a large amount of CBD that we said is actually quite safe, right? Good for pain and everything. Well, CBD can mess about with CYP3A4. So you block this. CBD can also mess with another pathway called CYP2D6. It's the second most important pathway for drug processing. CYP2D6 is responsible for metabolism of many of our antidepressant drugs, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, antipsychotic drugs, beta blocker drugs, opioid drugs as well, like codeine. Hmm. So that's an interesting kind of twist on my story, isn't it? That of all the drugs that this person was taking, if we offered up a pot, a cannabis product, an oil or something like that, and we said, let's be conservative, let's just give you a whole bunch of CBD because we don't want to make your brain uh, all stimulated and everything. We don't want your heart to go up. But what's interesting is that there could be a caution here. And that if you threw a lot of CBD into the mix, metoprolol goes higher, amlodipine goes higher, simvastatin goes higher, amitriptyline goes higher, warfarin, blood thinner goes higher. Potentially, this means the heart slows, blood pressure goes way down, you get muscle terrible side effects, you get sleepy or you get ir irregular heartbeats triggered by this stuff, your blood goes way, way thin and you may get some dangerous bleeding. And then uh, as a bonus on this side, um, your painkillers don't work anymore because of all this met metabolic stuff. So very interesting what the potential might be. Have I scared you enough yet? Um, what's the, what's the, what's the take-home from this? So is pot okay? Is cannabis okay in the setting of heart disease? Mostly okay. We have some cautions don't smoke things, uh, uh, creates a lot of safety. But if you use and start to use high doses of anything, CBD plus or minus THC, then do consult with a professional. Also do let your pharmacist know what you are taking. They can look up interactions like this and, and tell you about where's the potentials. And by the way, the good news on this is that there are alternatives that we could use for most of these drugs that would make it a much safer situation. If one really needed CBD and THC to function in life, if, if that's the way that you've kind of come to, then there are ways of changing all of this stuff as well to make the whole thing come together and be safe. If you wanna know more, you can turn to those uh, kind of uh, documents that I reference. This is the summary from one of those uh, review papers in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, just highlighting that there are lots of people who are using cannabis, marijuana. If you're one of them, you're not alone. Um, we, we should be aware that THC in particular can be overly exciting to the heart system as well as to the brain. And the products that are out there, they may have some effects that we don't intend. Here in Canada, I think we're, we're in a better space because things are more regulated. Things are better labeled, so you know what you're getting. Um, for us as healthcare practitioners, we need to think about screening and asking and having these discussions. And that's kind of my takeaway over the last few years, as I've learned more about this, that I'm very happy to have the conversation, happy to ask the question. In fact, I think it's really important. If I ask you about cigarettes, I should ask you about other stuff. I should ask you about uh, um, um, alcohol as well. And hopefully what we're going to see over time is just better research that's going to come out so that we're in a more informed state about this over time. Okay. I talked a whole lot today. Is there anybody that wants to ask a question at this point? Hands up or more Q&A? Anybody? Okay. Was that helpful to you? Q&A? 
Excellent. Thank you all. <laughs> Paula says helpful, but a total bummer. Well, sorry, Paula. I didn't say no, but just be careful or thoughtful with it. I think you should go into this with, with more. Um, you got just greater awareness about this. Uh, Diane, I have unmuted you if you'd like to ask your question. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. I just wondered since I, I just wondered what's the best um, if you really want to get advice about your own personal situation, how do you find a doctor that really knows what they're talking about? Uh, or do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I might do that. I, I'm not a cannabis prescriber. There's there's much more. Oh. So there are people that actually do this, uh, actually in a, in a big way. There are cannabis clinics, um, but doing the right one, not the one where you go into the back room with somebody with no knowledge about you or your situation, just give you a prescription, but rather there are really very thoughtful, knowledgeable people who uh, prescribe cannabis as, as their main medical practice. And, and that's probably where I would go. If you've got questions like you've got symptoms of pain, mood, other things going on, what's mm. the right approach to this? Um, that might be quite, quite useful for you, especially given your, your situations. Well, in my neighborhood, there's like six pot shops within <laughs> three blocks and I wouldn't walk into any of them and trust them to give me I mean, they're all just going to say, oh, this is great for you. And yeah. buy some CBD oil. It's it's just great for yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was even a, a CBC documentary about that, about how the pot shops are just recommending anything. So um, that's why I say, where do you go if you really want some, yeah. some to talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about? Yeah. So one of our colleagues has put into the chat, um, about very specific clinics, I think along the lines as we we're talking about that there are mm. dedicated uh, medical marijuana uh, clinics. Uh, uh, one of our colleagues writes that your GP should know how to get you there uh, mm. and that they are quite knowledgeable about all of these issues and the risks and benefits and okay. um, and 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 doing the appropriate kind of thing. So in my mind, you know, getting to the right kind of oil, for instance, Mm. or a capsule and then titrating that up in a, in a thoughtful, considerate manner, reassessing where you're at, making sure that there aren't any issues. Like that's the way to treat it as opposed to, as you've said, Diane, just go to the local store and they'll give you whatever. And it might be like, here's the one that sounds like the most fun, right? Cotton candy rainbow. Yeah. yeah here. Yeah. What is that? What's in it? Who knows? And is it good for me or not? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Ask my GP. Yeah, cool. Okay, thanks. All right, you're very welcome. Anybody else? Okay, seeing you at 7.30. Thank you very much for hanging in there. Thanks for taking your uh, part of your evening uh, for this. Uh, and um, uh, I, I do hope that that was of some um, uh, value to you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you either in the program or around the program uh, or in other educational uh, venues. And uh, your... Um, um, cardiac rehab supervisors, case managers, and others will do our, we'll all do our best to make sure that you know about some of these things. And thank you all and best to you as well. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night.